Okay, so, uh, welcome to this next video in the playlist on lipid metabolism. In this video, what we're going to talk about is uh, the LDL receptor. And towards the end, we're going to talk about familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, which results from mutations in the LDL receptor. Okay, so... Uh, to begin with in this video, what I want to first do is paint a picture of what LDL often, well, what LDL actually is, okay? Because often I think when people present the LDL receptor, they just start with LDL binds to the LDL receptor, and they don't tell you where the LDL actually came from and what its function was, okay? So I want to paint a more complete picture. I want to tell you where LDL comes from and the role that it plays in uh, the endogenous pathway, as it's called, which is a way of delivering uh, lipid molecules uh, to skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue when you are in the fasted state, i.e. you don't have lipid molecules being absorbed by the uh, intestine uh, which are coming into the blood. Okay, so, uh, what I firstly want to start off with is a discussion of the different types of lipid molecules. Then I want to discuss with you the endogenous pathway from uh, the uh, release of uh, triacylglycerol molecules from the adipocytes to uh, the formation of LDL, and then we'll discuss the LDL receptor and how uh, it is going to be involved in the receptor-mediated endocytosis of LDL molecules, and then finally we'll end the discussion uh, with familial hypercholesterolemia, which results from uh, mutations in the LDL receptor, which are loss of function mutations. Okay, right then. So let's start off with lipid molecules, okay? So we're going to discuss the four major types of lipid molecules. We're going to discuss triacylglycerols, phospholipids, sphingolipids, and then also cholesterol and cholesterol esters. Okay, so basically a lipid is uh, the more medical term for a fat molecule. Okay, so the sort of more common sense name for a lipid is a fat molecule. Okay, and uh, basically the common feature that all lipid molecules have is that they are generally quite hydrophobic. They don't interact well with water molecules. And the reason for this is that lipid molecules are generally very neutrally charged. Their molecules are very neutral, okay? And uh, there aren't many polar bonds in lipid molecules, which means that water molecules struggle to interact with them. And let me explain why. If we look at the structure of water, Basically, water has what is known as a very polar structure, okay? And this means that uh, you have one side which is quite negative, which is the oxygen tip here, and then one side which has a partial positive charge, okay? Now, why does this occur? Well, basically, it's because the electrons in these covalent bonds between the oxygen atom and the hydrogen atom, they aren't sitting in the middle between the hydrogen nucleus and the oxygen nucleus. In Instead, they end up closer to the oxygen nucleus than to the hydrogen nucleus. Now, why is this? Well, uh, basically, electrons have negative charge, so uh, they uh, are attracted to positively charged particles. Now, the nucleus of atoms um, basically has protons within it, which are positively charged particles, so nuclei are positively charged. So the electrons will be feeling attraction to both the nucleus of the oxygen atom and the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. The question now is which nucleus is better at pulling the electrons towards it? Well, basically, it's the oxygen nucleus that is better at pulling electrons towards it than the hydrogen nucleus. So the electrons sit towards the oxygen uh, and away from the hydrogen, okay? The fancy word for how strong a nucleus is uh, with regards to pulling electrons towards it is electronegativity, 
Okay, uh, so we would say that the electronegativity of oxygen is greater than the electronegativity of hydrogen, and all that means is that the ability of the oxygen atom to pull the electrons towards it is greater than the ability of the hydrogen uh, atom's nucleus to pull the electrons towards it. Okay, so the electrons sit towards the oxygen atom and that gives the oxygen atom a partial negative charge whilst it, the protons here, well the hydrogens, get this partial positive charge. Okay, right, so the water molecule has this polar structure. It has this permanent dipole, as it's called. So this is called a permanent dipole. A dipole just means um, an uneven dis... well... It means a positively charged point with a negatively charged point near it. So a negative portion and a positive portion. It's kind of like a magnet, but with electric charge rather than uh, magnetic fields. Okay, right. Uh, so that's what's meant by a permanent dipole. Okay, right. So water molecules have this permanent dipole structure, and this means that they can interact very nicely with other water molecules. Okay, so if I draw another water molecule here, basically the oxygen atom also has uh, a lone pair of electrons on it. Okay, and this water molecule will also be polar. So what can now happen is this proton can interact with the oxygen uh, atom of this other water molecule. Not only because the oxygen atom has a partial negative charge, but even better than that, the oxygen atom here has a lone pair of electrons. This lone pair of electrons is basically a center of negative charge. That's just a little, you know, a little cluster of electrons there, which will be a very dense portion of negative charge. So this positively charged hydrogen here can interact very nicely with that lone pair of electrons on the partially negatively charged oxygen. And this is a very strong form of intermolecular bonding known as hydrogen bonding. Okay, so water molecules combine to one another very strongly. Whereas if you ram a water molecule against a very neutral molecule, such as a lipid molecule, basically um, the intermolecular bonds that can form with that neutral molecule are much, much weaker than the intermolecular bonds that can form with other water molecules. So basically they don't, the water molecules won't want to break bonds that they have between other water molecules in order to form uh, bonds with a neutral uh, lipid molecule. Okay, so that's why uh, water doesn't generally want to interact with fat and the system will adopt uh, the confirmation which means that the you have as least uh, well as few um, interactions between the water molecules and these neutral lipid molecules as possible and that's why if you take a beaker of water and pour fat into it that you can't get those two to mix you'll get uh, the fat uh, splitting away from the water so you'll get two distinct layers basically Okay, right. And it's because that's the way that you can minimize the uh, interaction between the fat molecules and the water molecules. Okay, right. So, that's the common feature that all uh, fat molecules have. They're very, very neutral structures. So, let's see some examples now of fat molecules. So, we'll start with triacylglycerols. Okay, and for short, triacylglycerols can also be called triglycerides, and they're sometimes more often called triglycerides than triacylglycerols. Okay, uh, in addition, you can short tri shorten triacylglycerols uh, to even shorter word than triglycerides. Okay, you can shorten it down to tags. So T for tri, A for acyl, and G for glycerol, and then we'll put an S there. Okay, so let me now show you a cartoon of the structure of a triacylglycerol molecule. So basically, a triacylglycerol molecule uh, consists of a glycerol molecule, okay, with three long chain carboxylic acids esterified to it. Okay, so this vertical line here that I have now colored in uh, green, this is going to represent our glycerol molecule. Okay, so this is glycerol. Now, glycerol is the old biochemist name for a molecule that organic chemists would now call propane-123-triol.
Okay, and although propane-123 trial is uh, a bit more of a mouthful than glycerol, it's a useful name because it tells us exactly what the structure of this molecule is. It tells us that we're dealing with a free carbon molecule, that's the propane, and off each one of those carbons you have an alcohol group, that's the 123 trial, meaning that the overall molecule then now has free alcohol groups coming off it, one off each of the carbons. Okay, now, these uh, molecules that are represented by uh, horizontal lines that I'm now colouring in orange, uh, these are the fatty acids, okay? And again, fatty acids is the old biochemist name. Uh, these molecules are more correctly called long-chain carboxylic acids. And again, that's a good name because it tells us exactly what we're dealing with here. It tells us that we're dealing with carboxylic acid molecules which have a really long tail, basically. Okay, right. So, what you then have done is you've taken these really long-chain carboxylic acids Okay, so let me show one here. So here's the carboxylic acid group, and then I'll just put R here to denote uh, the long tail, which is very hydrophobic. And basically, uh, this can interact with the alcohol groups of the glycerol molecules. So let's say this is one of the alcohol groups on this glycerol molecule. And basically, what you can do is you can perform a reaction where you bind the carboxylic acid group to the alcohol group. And what you do is you uh, remove the alcohol group from the carboxylic acid group. You remove the hydrogen from the alcohol group of the uh, glycerol molecule. Okay, you combine those two together to make water, and then you bind the carbon of the long chain carboxylic acid to the oxygen of the uh, alcohol group of the glycerol molecule. And this is what's known as an ester link. Okay, so this is an ester link. So, we are going to take free long chain carboxylic acids and esterify them onto the glycerol molecule. Okay, so let me just give you an example of a long-chain carboxylic acid or a fatty acid. So basically, uh, the sort of archetypal example of a long-chain carboxylic acid would be stearic acid. And again, this is an old biochemist name for a molecule that would now be called octadecanoic acid. Okay, although if you're reading a biochemist textbook, it will be more likely referred to as stearic acid. Okay, right. Octadecanoic acid, once again, is the more useful name because this tells us exactly what we're dealing with. It tells us that we're dealing with a carboxylic acid that is fully saturated and which is 18 carbons long. So we have one carbon here, okay, and now uh, we need 17 more carbons. 16 of these are going to be in the form of methylene groups. So here is a methylene group. We'll want to repeat this 16 times. And then right on the end, we'll have a methyl group, like so. And that takes us up to 18 carbons overall. We've got 16 in the middle in these, uh, these methylene groups. And then we've got um, two on the end in the form of the methyl group and the carboxylic acid group. And because I don't want to have to draw 16 methylene groups out, I have basically drawn one and then bracketed it like, bracketed it, uh, like this and then put a suffix down here of 16. That's a useful trick to get around having to do a lot of pointless work. Right, okay, so stearic acid is a really long uh, chain carboxylic acid. And as you can see, this is an extremely hydrophobic tail because none of these bonds are really that polar at all. Of course, when you have two carbon atoms bound to each other, that's not going to be polar because the pull uh, that the electrons will be receiving from each of these nuclei is exactly the same because they're the same type of nucleus. Uh, but then Carbon and hydrogen pretty much have the same electronegativity as one another, so the electrons really do sit midway between them. So uh, you don't get polar bonds really at all. So this is a very non-polar structure, and therefore it doesn't interact well with water, and we would call it hydrophobic. 
So this is an example of a long chain carboxylic acid. So you are going to esterify free long chain carboxylic acids to the free alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. Now, there are other long chain carboxylic acids other than stearic acid. This is a nice example of one. Uh, but the free carboxylic acids which you bind to your glycerol molecule do not need to be the same long chain carboxylic acid. I, you could put stearic acid in position 1 here, and then you could have some totally different long chain carboxylic acid in position 2. Okay, so it's not set in stone which um, long chain carboxylic acids you then put in the final two positions once you've decided on your first one. You can have mixtures of different long chain carboxylic acids. And this then creates you what is known as a triacylglycerol, or for short, a TAG. Okay, so why is it called a triacylglycerol? What does acyl mean? Well, basically, if we look at our esterification reaction here again, you can see that when you add the carboxylic acid molecule onto the alcohol group, you don't actually add the entire carboxylic acid molecule. Instead, the alcohol group of the carboxylic acid molecule isn't actually added onto uh, the alcohol group of the glycerol molecule. And you only add what is left of the carboxylic acid molecule after you've taken this alcohol group off. This group that I have now circled in green here, this is what's known as the acyl group of the carboxylic acid molecule. Okay, so that's why we call these molecules triacylglycerols, because effectively we have free acyl groups added onto the free alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. Okay, so that's uh, a triacylglycerol. Now, there is actually another name that is used for triacylglycerols. They're also called neutral fat molecules. And as we'll see, when we look at other fat molecules, there's a good reason these are called neutral fat molecules, because their entire structure is completely neutral. They have not a single area which is polar, basically. And that's uh, a feature that we won't see in other lipid molecules, for instance, in the phosphoglycerolipids, in the sphingolipids, uh, and also in cholesterol, we will see that they're not really anywhere near as neutral as the triglycerides. So the triglycerides, if you like, are the apical lipids. They are the most hydrophobic you can get. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, let's now turn away from the triacylglycerols uh, onto our next form of lipids, uh, which is the phosphoglycerolipids. Okay, now the phosphoglycerolipids are all examples of what you would call phospholipids, okay? But they are not the only examples of phospholipids. They are the most famous examples of phospholipids compared to the other uh, phospholipids, which are not phosphoglycerolipids. But they are by no means the only phospholipids. And when we discuss sphingolipids, we'll see other examples of phospholipids which are not phosphoglycerolipids, okay? So they they are all phospholipids, but they are not the only type of phospholipid. In fact, to be a phospholipid, there's only two criteria that you need to meet. Within your structure, you need to have a long-chain carboxylic acid or a fatty acid, and you also need to have a phosphate group. That's all you need to have within your structure in order to be considered a phospholipid. Okay, so let's now have a look at the phosphoglycerolipids and see how they all fulfill these criteria and hence why they are all considered phospholipids. Okay, so phosphoglycerolipids have a structure like so. So they are based on glycerol, hence why they have the glycero there. Okay, so here in green, this vertical line here is uh, the glycerol molecule. Okay. And then, uh, in orange here, we have the long-chain carboxylic acid. Now, what I should have said before even starting drawing this structure is all of the phosphoglycerolipids are based on the structure of a molecule called phosphatidic acid. Okay, so, firstly, we need to have a look at the structure of phosphatidic acid, and then we can see how you modify phosphatidic acid to get a phosphoglycerolipid. Okay, so, 
basically phosphatidic acid has a glycerol molecule like so with two long chain carboxylic acids esterified onto the first and the second alcohol groups. Then of the third alcohol group you then have a phosphate group attached on. Okay, and that creates you phosphatidic acid. Now phosphatidic acid is considered a phospholipid because it has a fatty acid within its structure and a phosphate group. It's also considered a phosphoglycerolipid. It's basically the starting point for all the other phosphoglycerolipids, but it itself is considered a phosphoglycerolipid. Okay, right, so let's just discuss in a little bit more detail this phosphate group here and how we have attached the phosphate group onto the alcohol group of the third carbon of that glycerol molecule. Okay, right, so let's th let this be the alcohol group of that third carbon of the glycerol molecule. Then this is the structure of a phosphate group. So a phosphate group has a phosphorus atom at the centre, and then double bound to that phosphorus atom you have an oxygen atom, and then also off this phosphorus atom you have two alcohol groups like so, and then finally a single bond to an oxygen atom which has then acquired an electron via ionic means and therefore has a negative charge. Okay, so this is the structure of a phosphate group. Now, basically, I hope what you can appreciate is that if you just look at what I'm about to circle in red, okay, this little group here, that looks very, very similar to a carboxylic acid group. If we replace that phosphorus atom with a carbon atom there, ignore the fact that you've obviously got five bonds off here, which is absurd for carbon, okay, that would look like a carboxylic acid group. We know that carboxylic acid groups can react with alcohol groups. Okay, and basically these phosphate groups here can interact with alcohol groups in pretty much a identical way. So what can happen is the alcohol group can come off the phosphate group. The hydrogen can come off the alcohol group. Okay, those two things can combine together to make water, and then the oxygen atom of the alcohol group can bind to the phosphorus atom of the phosphate group in what's very similar to an ester link. Okay, and this sort of a link is known as a phosphoester link. Okay, so this is a phosphoester link. So, what we have done to create phosphatidic acid is we have esterified two long chain carboxylic acids onto the glycerol molecule, the first and the second carbon of the glycerol molecule, and then onto the third carbon of the glycerol molecule, we have attached a phosphate group via a phosphoester link. Now, I should just say that there is not just one phosphatidic acid molecule, okay, because these long chain carboxylic acids you had here were not set in stone, okay, so there are many different uh, types of long chain carboxylic acids that you could have in those two positions, and uh, you know, you can therefore have many different molecules of phosphatidic acid by varying the carboxylic acids that you have esterified to the first and second uh, carbons alcohol groups. Okay, right. Now, the other thing I want to mention is the difference between phosphatidic acid and another molecule called phosphatidate, the minor difference, okay? People will use these two terms interchangeably, but I just want to highlight the strict difference between the two. Okay, so strictly what I have drawn, well, what I've described for you here would be a phosphatidic acid molecule, okay, because it has this proton attached to this oxygen atom, okay, so remember what the definition of uh, acids is, with, that they can donate protons away into the solution, okay, so this molecule can donate a proton away into a solution and it's this proton off this alcohol group here so that proton can detach off the oxygen atom here and go into solution leaving this oxygen atom with a negative charge okay and the molecule that you're then left up with after the proton has gone off that is then called phosphatidate so phosphatidate is the
conjugate base of phosphatidic acid. Okay, so this is a general principle for all acids. Okay, once they have donated their proton away, the molecule that you are left up with will have a negative charge, and it is certainly no longer an acid molecule because it cannot donate protons away anymore. In fact, it's actually a base because a proton can come and stick onto that negative charge. For instance, this oxygen atom here with a negative charge, a proton can come and stick onto that. So it's called the conjugate base of the acid. So phosphatidate is the uh, name of the conjugate base of phosphatidic acid. But of course, you know, if you've got a phosphatidic acid molecule in solution, it will continually be donating its proton away and then receiving its proton back again, donating it away, receiving it back again. So it continuously flips between the protonated and unprotonated form, which is why you can get away with using phosphatidic acid and phosphatidate interchangeably because effectively you're describing uh, the two sides of the coin, if you like. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, basically this is phosphatidic acid. Phosphoglycerolipids are going to be derived from this, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to attach to the phosphate group another group. And let me explain how you're going to do this. So what you might have noticed is that these phosphate groups, which are linked to alcohol groups, well, to the third uh, alcohol of the glycerol molecule, vialis phosphorester link, it still has one of these carboxylic acid-like domains uh, visible here, well, intact. Okay, so it's actually got another one of these carboxylic acid-like groups. Okay, so we've got here, circled in turquoise, a phosphorus atom, double bound to an oxygen with an alcohol group. This can basically do exactly the same thing as this one circled in red did. So if we bring along another alcohol molecule here, what can happen is you can get another phosphester link being formed. So the alcohol group will come off the phosphate group, the hydrogen will come off the alcohol whole group, those will go away to form water, and the phosphorus atom will then link onto the oxygen atom of the alcohol group via another phosphodiester, sorry, a phosphoester link. Okay, right. Uh, so, you can basically attach additional groups onto the other side of this phosphate group via phosphoester links. So all you need is an alcohol group and then we can attach you onto that phosphate group. Now there are all sorts of groups that you can attach on here and when you do that the resulting molecule you get is what's known as a phosphoglycerolipid. Now I'm going to give you the major example that we're going to need in this video, okay, which is a molecule known as phosphoglycerolipid choline. Okay, so I should say that all of these phosphoglycerolipids, which are derivatives of phosphatidic acid, their names all start with phosphatidyl, okay? And what this means is that they are derivatives of phosphatidic acid. They've got this phosphatidic acid group, if you like, or this phosphatidyl group stuck onto another molecule. And this is going to be phosphatidylcholine, and literally what it is, is a choline molecule linked via a phosphester link to a phosphatidic acid molecule. Okay, now phosphatidylcholine is often just abbreviated to PC, and it's also got another name. It's also commonly called lecithin, and whenever you do anything with regards to um, metabolism, you'll often hear people talking about lecithin, and it's just the old name for phosphatidylcholine. So, let me just show you the structure of the molecule choline that we are going to link via a phosphester link onto the phosphate group of our phosphatidic acid molecule. Okay, so basically, uh, choline has to be an alcohol in order for it to be able to be linked to the uh, phosphate group via a phosphester link. And basically, it's the same molecule uh, that you have within the famous neurotransmitter acetylcholine. In acetylcholine, you have esterified and acetic acid molecule onto choline. Remember, acetic acid is just the old name for ethanoic acid, which is what's in vinegar, the two-carbon carboxylic acid. 
Okay, so we're now just going to see the pure alcohol on its own, which is called choline. Okay, so basically choline has an ethylene group in the middle, so it's got these two carbons here, and then on the other side, to the side where the alcohol group is, you've got a nitrogen atom, and this nitrogen atom has three methyl groups coming off it. One, two, and then three. Now, nitrogen isn't supposed to have four bonds. Uh, in the ideal world, it would only have three. So what's happened here is that the nitrogen atom has donated both electrons uh, of its usual lone pair into one of these bonds. Okay, so the normal understanding of a covalent bond is that uh, one electron comes from each of the members. So the nitrogen puts in an electron, the carbon puts in an electron, and then they hold the electrons in between them and share them, basically. Okay, but in one of these bonds, let's say it's this one here, the nitrogen will put both electrons, okay? So it has a, it used to have a lone pair, and it's put both of those electrons of the lone pair into one of these bonds. Okay, right. Now, when it does that, it's effectively lost itself an electron, because, as I say, the understanding of a covalent bond is that one electron belongs to the nitrogen and one belongs to the carbon. So if the nitrogen puts in both here, it's as though it's given one away to the carbon. Okay, so the nitrogen gets a positive charge. And you might ask, well, does that mean the carbon gets a negative charge because it's received this extra electron? Well, the answer is no, because the carbon would have originally come into this uh, sordid arrangement here uh, with a positive charge, basically. So the carbon would have come along have already having had an electron nicked off it, basically. And then it's come along bound to the nitrogen, nicked an electron off that nitrogen, neutralized itself, and left the nitrogen with a positive charge. So basically, it's deferred the positive charge onto the nitrogen. So the whole choline molecule overall is positively charged. So, what you're then going to do is take this alcohol group, and just as I've described here, you're going to link via a phosphorus to link this choline molecule onto the phosphate group of the phosphatidic acid molecule to create a molecule of phosphatidyl, that's referring to this portion, and then choline, okay, often abbreviated to PC and um, sometimes called lecithin. Okay, so all of these phospholipids are phospholipids. They all satisfy the condition that they have a fatty acid within their structure, most definitely, and a phosphate group, because phosphatidic acid has all of that. So, of course, if they're derivatives of that, they will satisfy that condition. Now, let me contrast them to triacylglycerols. Remember, triacylglycerols were sometimes called neutral fat molecules, and we remember they deserve that type because their entire structure is incredibly neutral. There is no polar bonds anywhere, okay? In contrast, these phospholipids, yes, they have an extremely uh, neutral portion over here, which is very hydrophobic, but this phosphate group, this has got this oxygen atom here, which has a negative charge, a full negative charge. Now, that's a good, good polar structure there, okay? So, um, the phosphate group is certainly polar, and that wouldn't be able to interact with water molecules very nicely, because, you know, that's a strong negative charge there. In addition, the groups that we add on, for instance, choline, choline has a positive charge over here, so it's got a group, it's got a charge as well, basically. So the heads of these phosphoglycerolipids often will be quite good at interacting with water. They'll be quite hydrophilic. So they're not like the triacylglycerols, which cannot interact with water at all. Okay, right. So we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video we'll continue our discussion of the lipids before moving on to the endogenous pathway.